I'm Pranav Sivakumar. For the past one and a half years, I've been researching almost dark galaxies in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Over the past few decades, scientists have come up with increasingly accurate end body simulations of dark matter halos, which evolve into galaxies. Here's what such a simulation for a Milky Way like galaxy looks like. There's a large central bulge of matter, which represents the main galaxy, and several smaller patches of dark matter, which represent satellite galaxies. Scientists ran into a problem. As soon as they compared the number of satellite galaxies predicted from these simulations to the number of satellite galaxies known, this discrepancy became known as the missing satellite problem. Since then, we found a number of other satellite galaxies that weren't discovered at the time, including Virgo 1, which was reported very recently. However, we're still very far from solving the missing satellite problem. One of the most intriguing solutions that was proposed to explain this problem was that the majority of these unseen satellite galaxies are almost dark galaxies, or ADGs. Normal matter is the stuff we deal with every day. This can range from this desk to even the Higgs boson. On the other hand, dark matter doesn't interact with anything we know of. Because ADGs are dominated by dark matter, there's little to no starlight coming from them, and this makes them difficult to detect. Most ADGs are dwarf galaxies. This means they have much fewer stars than normal galaxies, and thus generally a lesser mass. While the Milky Way is 10 to the 12 solar masses in mass, ADGs generally range from 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 9 solar masses in mass. Why are ADGs important? They can help us understand how galaxies formed and evolved, and help determine the nature and distribution of dark matter, which can tell us about the future of the universe. Through my research, I'm trying to detect ADGs using their photometric characteristics. ADGs generally fall into two classes, those that are more compact and those that are more extended. To identify the more compact ADGs, I developed the bounding box algorithm. And to identify the more extended ADGs, I developed the blue clustering algorithm. The data extraction and processing for both algorithms was done using the SDSS catalog archive server and the CAST jobs SQL interface, while the data analysis and visualization was done using Python. Let's look at how the bounding box algorithm works. Most astronomical objects are brightest near the center, and their light goes out radially until it doesn't exceed that of the sky. SDSS bounding boxes are drawn at this boundary between foreground and background. Now, if there's a faint patch of light near this boundary, then that'll cause the bounding box to, to shift off center from their primary photometric objects. However, this criterion alone isn't enough to identify ADGs. I introduced area and geometric constraints, which helped reduce the number of false positives identified, as well as color constraints, where I selected for blueness. This provides two advantages. First of all, blue galaxies are young and they're forming stars, so it's much easier to understand galaxy formation and evolution. Second, blue galaxies can be seen at farther redshifts than, say, red galaxies can. And because of this, it's possible to identify more blue ADGs. I included three sets of color cuts. The most restrictive color cut looks specifically at the colors of known ADGs and tries to find near replicas of those ADGs, whereas two less restrictive color cuts searched for varying degrees of blueness. The most restrictive color cut was very selective. On the other hand, for the two less restrictive color cuts, uh, they were actually not able to identify a manageable number of candidates. When I did my initial search, uh, the two less restrictive criteria turned up tens of millions of target ADG candidates. Uh, to narrow this down to a manageable number of candidates, I introduced additional physics. I searched all of these target ADG candidates for quasars within 0.5 arc minutes. Subsequently, I looked for calcium-2 absorption lines in the spectra of these background quasars. I did this because my mentor and I theorized that if there are calcium-2 absorption lines that are not at a quasar's redshift but are present in the quasar spectrum, and they have no obvious optical counterpart, then they must be originating from an ADG. For candidates that could not be identified by the bounding box algorithm, I developed the blue clustering algorithm. Initially, this began by separating an SDSS field into patches of equal areas and searching each patch for clusters of blue regions that would be indicative of ADGs. However, this approach is only partially successful. This was primarily because many of the candidates straddled these patches, so the blue clustering algorithm was not able to identify them. After further discussions with my mentor, I removed these patches, 
resulting in me running the blue, the blue clustering algorithm simply with colors, as well as the other criteria described in the flowchart on the right. Looking at the results, I began with hundreds of millions of SDSS galaxies and ended up with only 25 high probability candidates. Those are in class A and originated from the most selective color criterion. Those from classes B and C were also selective, but they originated from the two less restrictive criteria and the criterion of having the calcium-2 absorption lines in background quasar spectra. Until very recently, most ADGs had been discovered serendipitously. The alfalfa survey was one of the first targeted surveys for ADGs. It looked for H121 centimeter radio clouds, which are indicative of ADGs if there is no known optical counterpart associated with them. So I compared my results from the class A candidates against these alfalfa detections with no known optical counterpart. There were no matches between the two candidate sets. This may be because of the differing spatial distribution of the two sets. I found that all three color cut criteria were now very selective, but I wanted to get a better idea of the kind of candidates that the bounding box algorithm was identifying. Uh, so I performed a student's t-test of mean bounding box area over the three color cut groups. These showed that there was a statistically significant difference in bounding box area across all three groups. Notably, for the most restrictive color cut, the mean bounding box area was much higher, and this is because uh, the bounding box algorithm identified a greater variety of candidates than it was expected to. Whereas for the two less restrictive criteria, uh, their mean bounding box sizes are more of what was expected from the bounding box algorithm, as well as the overall SDSS bounding box size distribution. To understand the parameter space through larger scale relationships between the variables, I performed a categorical analysis of bounding box off-center distance against model magnitude. This showed several tendencies within the data, but there were no statistically significant associations. Furthermore, there were several cases uh, in several quadrants, there were less than five data points, and this made calculation of the chi-squared unreliable. The statistical analyses helped uncover some relationships between the key parameters, but the first major test of the bounding box algorithm was comparing it to two known ADGs, Leo P and Leoncino from the alfalfa survey. On the right is the image of Leo P from SDSS, and on the left are the images from the 3.5 meter WIYN telescope and Hubble. In the SDSS image, Leo P was able to be resolved into its constituent photometric objects, so it was able to be identified by both the bounding box and blue clustering algorithms. Leoncino, on the other hand, is a more interesting case. Uh, it's one of those more compact ADGs, so it was not identified as separate photometric objects, and it was able to be separated only by Hubble. And this kind of emphasizes the importance of follow-up observations. Uh, not only does the Leo P image appear much clearer in WIYN and Hubble, uh, but the Hubble image from Leoncino was actually able to resolve the constituent stars in Leoncino, which SDSS could not. Here are a set of six candidates identified by the bounding box algorithm out of the 25 total. Uh, and the candidate on the top right is very interesting because it's able to be confirmed uh, as blue through digitized sky survey or DSS images. Uh, the DSS red image uh, show, doesn't show the candidate at all. Uh, it's pretty much inconspicuous, while the blue image does show the candidate. And this, it, this shows uh, that the candidate is, in fact, blue. Uh, in general, all the candidates resemble either Leo P or Leoncino in morphology. And in many of them, uh, it's clear that the bounding box is off-center from its primary photometric object. Oops. Uh, I concluded that the algorithm was effective not only in matching reference ADGs, uh, but also in identifying a number of new candidates. Notably, uh, the bounding box algorithm is one of the first algorithms to identify ADGs using optical means, to specifically identify ADGs using optical means. And it also saves hundreds of hours of telescope time. Whoops. <laughs> I'm looking to continue and confirm these ADGs uh, through multiple avenues. I've already begun spectral follow-up from the DuPont telescope uh, in Chile with assistance from my mentor. I'm looking to confirm the candidates identified uh, by the bounding box algorithm also using time uh, that my mentor has on the DIS spectrograph on the Apache Point Observatory Telescope in New Mexico. Uh, we have already begun preparing for these observations, and they're going to occur in the next two or three weeks. Uh, I'm also drafting proposals to obtain 21-centimeter radio spectra for the Meerkat and FAST telescopes. 
Uh, and this is kind of the reverse of what alfalfa was doing. Uh, they began with these radio detections and used them uh, to follow up in the optical. On the other hand, I'm beginning with optical detections that I got derived from the bounding box algorithm and following them up in radio band. Uh, there are several avenues I'm pursuing uh, to continue my work, uh, specifically, uh, on the graph of absolute magnitude versus distance, uh, the blue line represents the SDSS limit. And there are several uh, black dots just below that limit, uh, which are mo the, mo the majority of which are satellite galaxies that were identified by the Dark Energy Survey. Um, and I'm looking to apply the blue clustering algorithm to DES uh, to find fainter ADGs, just as they were able to find fainter satellite galaxies, since DES not only has a larger aperture telescope, but also a more sensitive camera. I'm looking to adapt the algorithms to look for larger galaxies like Dragonfly 44. Dragonfly 44 is a recent breakthrough uh, because it's a dark galaxy that's unusually large. Uh, it's almost the size of the Milky Way, but in fact, uh, it's kind of really contrary to what you would expect uh, from a normal dark galaxy. As I mentioned, uh, ADGs are generally 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 9 solar masses in mass, so this is a complete change, and I'm looking to adapt the algorithm to identify that. I'm also looking to uh, stack quasar spectra from the two less restrictive criteria to identify a calcium-2 signal. Uh, this will help confirm uh, the theory that my advisor and I proposed uh, of where these calcium-2 absorption lines with no associated optical counterpart actually come from. I'd like, to acknowledge, <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge a few people who are invaluable in this research. I'd like to thank my mentor, uh, Dr. Don York from UChicago, uh, for his tireless effort. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Sean Johnson from Princeton uh, for pursuing some of the follow-up observations on the DuPont telescope. Uh, the Siemens Foundation Discovery Education and George Washington University are putting on such a wonderful event and letting me share my work with the public. And the SDSS program for making their data free and available to everyone, including me, to pursue research. Thank you very much for your time.